We were established in 2014. Um, we're a specialist pharmaceutical company. We have two divisions, and that's very important. We are not the classic biotech where you put everything into one venture, where you go raise two, three hundred million, and you get all the way through to phase three, and then it all fails, and everybody loses their money. We're a multi-value opportunity. We've got two divisions, one around reformulation of existing medicines, and the other around a drug delivery system for vaccines. And that's very important because it gives us the, the route to market so that we can actually earn some revenues very quickly. We're a very much a lower risk, less costly um, pharma company, um, but we're not a hedging our bets in lots of different things. Each opportunity we work on has got high value potential in its own right. So we don't look at any product that's going to you know, look at generating sales less than 300 million a year. Um, and that's the, the, the sweet spot that we're in. We also have a very highly experienced management team. We'll go through that. My background is in boots and product development. Um, you'll see that I'm trying to bring product development skills from the consumer world into pharma. And we are also backed by a very, very strong intellectual property portfolio. And this is our business. Our business model is to reformulate drugs or, with the, or, or, or vaccines, but doing it in a way that we just take to market what we need to do in order to do a commercial deal. We're not about taking everything through to the marketing authorization ourselves, spending hundreds of millions of pounds, but we're getting the products commercially ready so that we can do a deal. Because that's the experience. We, you don't need to actually come up with a brand new drug. You just need to make an existing drug work better. So we're always working where there's unmet patient need. We're working in areas where there are strong clinical um, recommendations going to be given for our products. And that means we can license to the pharma companies at a point when it's the right thing for us. So I'm going to take you through two of the, two, the first two lead products. One is our sildenafil reformulation. Sildenafil is the generic name for Viagra. And the other we'll look at with our vaccines business. Now, the reason we're starting with the sildenafil business is because it's a huge market opportunity. There are 100 million or so sufferers of erectile dysfunction in some form or other just in Europe and US alone. And this is going to get more and more as people get older. However, there's not that many of them actually presenting for treatment. But those that do present for treatment and actually get referred drugs typically use what is known as PDE5 inhibitors. I'm not going to bombard you with lots of science and tech tonight. But PDE5 inhibitors are basically the drug of choice, which sildenafil is one, which works to basically block the blocker that causes the problem with people getting erections. So there are various PDE5s that are actually prescribed. Sildenafil is by far the most popular, which is Viagra. That's in volume in terms of numbers of people being referred, not value terms. And that's really important for us because we're actually working off that product. The issue is, is that the products don't work particularly well for erectile dysfunction. That might sound a bit of a bizarre statement for a, a four or five billion dollar market. But these were drugs that were developed, for, originally Viagra was developed for heart condition. The erectile dysfunction market came out of a side effect that was seen for people taking the heart drugs. So, Cut a long story short, that's why it was brought to market. But in essence, it takes about an hour before it starts to work, and it doesn't last very long. Oh, and by the way, don't try taking it with food. That's not a particularly good drug for erectile dysfunction. So other people came along so I was, and started to look at different products. And people basically have taken one aspect of the different performance. They rather try and make it work quicker. They try and make it last longer. There's some guys looking at gels and creams, which will last very quickly, but then it won't last long at all. What we're doing is we're looking to get the product to work quicker. We're getting to make it last longer and make sure you can take it with food. That's the perfect profile for an erectile dysfunction drug. And that's, one, that's what we're doing by working with the existing drug. Not a brand new drug. It doesn't take 100 million to bring it to market. It takes four to five million to get it through because it's through a regulatory procedure that's very well established. And the reason we are so confident in the market potential that we think we can get in that huge market and looking at this 300, 500 million um, dollar products is because we've been out and asked clinicians. We talked to people about what are you recommending and would you recommend based on our perfect product profile? 
And they came back to say, yeah, if you can get that profile, we'll switch people into your product. So that's what makes us feel very confident that we know we can actually achieve some of these market shares that we're looking to aim for. Now, here's a little bit of a techie slide. I promise you I wasn't going to give you any techie slide, but I'm not really going to give you that much tech. The gray chart is what you see from a typical drug. And this is the typical profile of Viagra at the moment. So what happens with a drug is you have this therapeutic window that it needs to be effective. So if you haven't got enough drug in your body, it can't work. Very simple. It takes a while before it starts to hit that point between you've got enough and then it hits a maximum and then over time it disappears. So this is back to the profile that I said earlier. Uh, Viagra takes about an hour before it starts to work and it only lasts about six hours. What we're doing is we're reformulating the existing drug using techniques but not changing the drug. That means we can actually get it in the, in the body much quicker. So we can get it in within 15 to 20 minutes. And then we flatten out the profile, which is we're the, like, the air's rock compared to the standard mountain profile that you would see from a drug. So it lasts much, much longer before it disappears out of the therapeutic window. So that's the principle behind what we're doing. So it's not rocket science, but it's very clever science. And we're using with the, our, to, our techniques that we're using means but we have a patented product profile around this. And for the first time now, we're able to start talking about what we're doing. The reason we've been quite quiet, and a lot of people haven't heard of us, is because of our patents, we couldn't tell people about what we were doing. We had to wait until our patents were published. And once our patents are published, we can now tell because we, we've got a range of products that we're working off and they all have very similar approaches. So having gone public with this, anything else we do, we're still covered for our other patents by the fact that they're not going against it. And the way it works is a sort of triple effect. We've got the first part, which you put under your tongue for 60 seconds and the outer core. So you've got an inner core with sildenafil citrate and an outer core with sildenafil base. There's a bit of technical there. That bit passes what they call through the sublingual wafer and gets into the, the, the body really quickly and it bypasses the stomach. The rest of it is then swallowed and is in the stomach and it works normally like standard Viagra. The 80% is in the core that releases slowly in the upper intestine. And that's what gives us our profile. The sublingual bit gets us quick. You then release it normally and then the intestine slowly brings out that absorption of the drug. So it's just reformulating the existing drug with different techniques. But we've got the pattern around the core. I mean, we've, we've deliberately shown you here the inner core. It won't be blue in real life. It's not good for development if you can't see where your core and your coat starts. So that's why we've made that blue. So that, in essence, is the product that we're developing. And the way we're bringing it to market is we've done all the in vitro formulation work. We were into clinic, our first in clinic trials in 2018, in January, start to get results back in quarter two, 2018. We then look to start talking to people about whether to do a commercial deal here or whether it might make sense for us to come back to our shareholders and say, you know what, the data is so good, we want to take it through to marketing authorization ourselves. So 2018 mid, there was a bit of a value inflection point for us. That's when we go to the FDA and we take them through what we're going to do and get the nod, yes or no, as to whether they like what we're doing. So that's the business model for reformulation. And I, oh, sorry, as I mentioned, there are lots of other products. We've got another three patents that we're taking the same approach for, and it's a replicable model, each one that we go through. So we're not just a one trick pony. It's something I keep telling to people and our investors. We're a multi-valuation opportunity, each one with very high potential. And that brings us on to NUVEC. So we announced some results today, um, which I think are absolutely fantastic results, and I'll go through a little bit what they are. It's a slightly different area in terms of vaccine delivery, but the business model you'll see for us is very similar in that we just spend enough money to get it commercially ready. We're not taking something right the way through. DNA and RNA are the real buzz areas at the moment in vaccines and cancer therapies and treatments, and um, primarily because that's the, the new science is there, but you have to have a delivery system in order to get that DNA or RNA into the body and make it work. So the big issue, the challenge that people face is how do we get the DNA into the cells so that they can express the proteins and do the things that they need to do. So you need that delivery system. And most people at the moment tend to use some form of either a lipid or a nanoparticle system to actually encapsulate or bind together with the DNA 
and then deliver it into the different cells. We brand our technology at the moment NuVec. Um, that's what we're calling it for, the, for now. We believe it's a real potential breakthrough because we can actually deliver nucleic acids in a far, far, far more effective way. So a bit of a comparison between lipid nanoparticles and ourselves. Um, we don't have any in vivo toxicity. In vivo means in animal or in human. So there, we've, we, don't, we don't have toxicity issues at all. Lots of lipid, lipid nanoparticles do. Our particle is uniquely designed to work with DNA, and that's really important. You'll see some of the details about how it works. That means we can get a lot more of it on. We can then protect the DNA on its journey into the cell, and we don't get much falling off. It sounds fairly simple, but they're the problems that you have with lipid nanoparticles. Because of the way ours work, if you, to try and get a lot of a, a DNA onto a lipid nanoparticle, you have to put a lot on it, a lot of it falls off. If a lot of it falls off, it ends up floating around the body and you end up with this unwanted immunotherapy effect. You want your DNA to go and do its thing in the cell. You don't want it floating around the rest of the body, ending up in the wrong place. And this is how it works. So we have, say so DNA has got a loop-like structure. So you see that's a typical piece of DNA. RNA is slightly different. It's a little bit more scattery all over the place. But in essence, it's very difficult to attach that to a solid or spherical particle, which most lipids tend to be. What we have here is a hollow sphere, a silica sphere, that's got these tiny little spikes on them. Now these tiny little spikes trap the DNA within the, within the spikes, and then they get put into the body. Over time, about 24 to 48 hours, these spikes release, and then that releases the DNA to allow it to do its thing. It's a very clever design, but it's not difficult to make, and that's really important. This is not a hugely expensive manufacturing process, um, and that's something that means we're going to be very, very well placed when we start taking it to, mar to market. There's a lot more that goes on behind the actual tech, but that's all you really need to know about how it works and why we're able to get so much. So we can get a really high level of DNA loaded onto here. We get about 95% loaded onto our, our particle and bound and then protected on its journey to the cell, which is an incredibly high amount. And that's particularly useful for something like a larger nucleic acid. So imagine if that is quite big, it's even harder to put it onto a standard lipid. But for us, you can get that onto ours, no problem. We can probably deliver four or five different RNAs or DNA strains on at the same time. Another key benefit in the industry. And the reason we're so excited is because it's, again, we talk back to each other having a different value opportunity. It's a massive opportunity. The, the, DNA, the, the DNA drug delivery market, the nanotechnology market, is forecast to grow to about 12 billion in, by 2023. I've just picked some example companies. Now, we're not particularly focusing on these. These are just examples of a couple of platform technology companies that have got different systems, one focus on antibody generation, one of an, an alternative tech to antibodies, and the sort of market caps that they're already generating in their early years are very, very high indeed. The other thing to really note is that the deals in this space are massive. This is a, a small private company, Crescendo Biologics, did a deal with Takeda for an, another multi-target. This is an antibody product where they're looking at multi-targets into one. They got an upfront royalty payment of 36 million and ongoing royalties of around 750 million. There are lots and lots of different companies in this space. There are also a huge amount of pharma and biotech companies looking for solutions. If you're spending two to 300 million to take a drug through to a vaccine, a DNA through to market, why would you not spend 20, 30 million on a system that's gonna give you greater potential to get there? So if I go to one of these you know, bio forums, about a third of the market now is people looking at cancer and vaccines and therapies and all these different areas. But again, what we're doing is we're not taking it all the way through to market. We're not spending two, three hundred million to bring a new vaccine to market ourselves. We're doing what we can with our delivery technology so that we can engage with people in the preclinical trial space. So we need to be ready for the technology needs to be ready for human trials by 2020 for all of us to start getting royalties there. But what we need to focus on at the moment, and what we are focusing on, are all the studies that we need to do to show those points of difference of how and why we're different to lipid nanoparticles and what makes our product so attractive. That means we can start industry collaborations next year. 
and we're looking to mul have multiple applications and, and collaborations with industry parties um, who have got their own. De there are hundreds and hundreds of people who are spending money and time and effort coming up with these new DNA structures. That's not our space. We're going to take their structures, work with them. There's people like Medimmun, Adzema, AstraZeneca, SecureVac. These are all big companies that have got mul multi millions of pounds invested into their DNA structures but are really struggling to get them into the cells to make them work, which is one of the reasons why not many have actually come to market. We really think that our technology can help overcome that. The other thing just to mention is really important. It's not just about cancer vaccines. This technology, the way that it's structured, means we can also work in therapeutics. The results we released today talked about both the results we had for directly injecting it directly into the tumour for a therapy and also directing it to the side of the tumour to show how it works as an antigen vaccine uh, technology as well. There's, the fact that it is then expressing that protein means we could use this technology for people delivering their own in, in, immunotherapy drugs. And also it's got potential for antibiotic resistance. Now all those are going to need a lot more investigation, but we've got access to all these different applications just using this one system. And the system is very strong, very unique, and those spikes, they're the things that give it that unique potential, which is why it's very patentable and very you know, interesting to the guys in this space. So that's an overview of who we are and what we do. So we have two divisions, multiple opportunities, each one with high value. That's something that I'll keep coming back to again and again. We are not your classic one trick pony biotech company. We're looking at a very quick, low cost, fast route to market, both for generics and for vaccines for us. And we have a highly experienced team back with IP. We've got a very small team in the board. We've got a pharma background experience. We have a very strong group of consultants that we use who are X, A, Z, most, mostly. We're based in Derbyshire. Um, AstraZeneca closed down uh, a big site in Loughborough and left us hundreds of brilliant scientists that we can use in the area. It's fantastic. What these guys used to do was screen companies like me and what we're doing to, to see whether or not they're going to work with them. So what we have done, we've taken our research and switched it away from just being pure academic research and we're researching the questions that the pharma companies ask. So when we go and start talk, talking to them, we're actually starting to address those questions head on. So we're not just doing research for the sake of research, we're researching why and how our product compares to lipid nanoparticles. We're working with scientists who used to evaluate the lipid nanoparticles and going, wow, you know what, this is really, really working, guys. So that's what we're trying to do in those, in those areas. So that's it, short and sweet. I'm trying to keep it down under the 25 minutes. Good evening, Nigel. We, we, I know we spoke about yep. this briefly before the meeting, but I wonder if you could comment on why do you think that Zando with their sublingual film and Pfizer with their, oral, um, with their dispersible tablet in the mouth, both of which have got European licenses, mm -hmm could only show bioequivalence, i.e. the same rate of absorption, and you're expecting to presumably show a superior rate of absorption. Why, why, why did they Good fail question. and why would you succeed? Well, they didn't fail. So what Pfizer have done with their, so there's two products you just mentioned there, I'll take them both. The Pfizer one, which has a license, actually was done purely and utterly to give them six months extra extension on their patent. So they took Viagra, they put it into an ODT, they call it an oral dispersible tablet. And what that does, it has exactly the same profile as their existing drug. So it's completely bioequivalent, which means it's got no difference. The only thing is it's an oral, it was actually marketed as a children's product. Not a lot of call for it, as far as I can see. But it was, so there was a reason why they do that and they have it licensed, but they don't market it. Um, our bit is using that. So the, the oral dispersible tablet part that gets swallowed will work exactly like Viagra. But the thing that's different for us is that we've got this outer coat that gets the first bit that goes sublingually, which is the first product you mentioned. The first product is pure sublingual, and I think it's a wafer, so it's a film or a wafer that you put under your gum. The dose that that delivers is up here, way above the maximum tolerated dose, so they won't get a license, really, for that to actually work. They have to take the dose down because they're not getting the approval, because they've got real safety issues and profiles. The other thing that's really important in this market space is still 93% of people like to take tablets. As is a tablet, people are used to that. Oral dispersible technologies have been around for years. 
new sublingual tablet. People don't like putting wafers and things in their mouth. They want to take a tablet. You, you train your children to take tablets. At the age of five or six, you stop them having to sort of, you know, people would, ideally a kid would like to take a chew or something like that to have a, but you teach them that you've got to take tablet because then you're a big boy or a big girl. So this is ingrained on people. This is background from I've got my time back at Boots. When, so we work on tablets. So we're using the best bits of different products to create the perfect profile. So that's, so we're working on the fact that these haven't failed, but everyone's got a slight different way of doing it. Well, well good, good luck with that. Yep. Um, can I ask you about your silica particles mm -hmm. as well? Um, I mean, how does it, is it, is it sort of like colloidal silica, like carbacil and it's, aerosol? It's silica dioxide that converts into natural silica. So it, it's not a hard resin. It's, so silica dioxide is a nat well, when it converts into silic acids, a naturally occurring um, silica. So what you find with the bit that dissolves is the silica that's left, this nat will, will convert and then degrade out of the body. So it doesn't stay in the body, so you don't get the issues with fibrosis that you have had from some of the very early silica products. Why do you think then that your, your DNA, it, it, you load it onto the silica particle and mm -hmm. then it presumably will get injected um, by so it gets either, either directly into the yeah. tumour or subcutaneously is what we're looking so, at. So why won't it dissociate in in the blood plasma, but you are expecting it to dissociate within the, within the target it's cell. Over the time, over the time it takes. So it's well, it's this dissolution profile takes about forty eight hours. Oh, okay. So it's just so a, it's speed, a slow, speed, it's thing. A speed it, thing. Yeah. yeah. So it, for the first, it's bound, and it's and that's the thing that's really important. It's bound. It sticks to our particle. It then gets delivered. It it creates. What you have to do with the vaccines, you have to create the little bit of immune response so it attracts the antigens to the point of the injection. So it stays there long enough and then it gets taken away and that's taken up by the cell. Given your realistic or maybe even conservative assessments of how long it'll take you to get these products to be generating real revenue, mm -hmm. how much more cash will you need to raise in order to be able to get there? Or do you have enough already? Generating revenue for us or generating revenue for the for products? You. For so you. for us, there's two elements. So with the generics business, as mentioned to 2018, we could do a deal at that point if we can strike a deal early enough, or we can potentially go back to the share and say, look, actually what we would do is prefer to raise another two or million, because it'll be about one to one and a half million to take it through to the marketing authorization. For the vaccines business, we will get revenues from the early preclinical stage when people are working with our system. We, otherwise, we'll be just the same as a biotech. We're reliant on them to get to that. Now. But if we're working with six or seven companies that are each paying us during that time from milestone payments up front, I think I mentioned here for the, that we'll be looking, we'll be getting milestone upfront payments ourselves whilst these guys are going. Because these guys doing the DNA might take another five to 10 years before they finally get to, to royalty payments. But while they're using our system, I mean, it, that's why these other companies like Scanson are earning very high revenues because they're getting paid throughout the preclinical process. So unless you choose there's a commercial benefit in raising more money and delaying, you think you've got enough money to get through to generating revenues? Yes. That's what we hope. Yeah, through to, to, so that's what we raised last year to get to 2018. Yep. What would be for you the greater challenge and potentially the, the greatest hook for any uh, marketing partners later. Is it the early dissolution where you might get the sort of quick release and a spike in blood levels? Or is the greater challenge the, the tail end, the slow release part? I what think it's a combination of the both because what you find with the existing products that just look at faster acting, they're not lasting very long in the body. Now, back to my days at Boots, when my, I developed products from a consumer point of view for the generics business. What you, people, if people who suffer from erectile dysfunction who don't want erections, they want a normal sex life. And that's incredibly important. And a normal sex life means you want to take your tablet and then not have to worry about it. So you don't want to have to take your tablet and think, oh God, I've got to wait an hour. Or oh, I can't eat, oh dear. Or oh, no, it's only gonna last four hours, what happens? What do I do after that? And people, that stress, which adds to the condition, 
So what you want is a normal sex life. So you take your tablet and you know that it's in the system and therefore the way Viagra works is it allows you to react to sexual stimulation. It's not like a cream that's instant that you rub the cream on and it causes an effect. It's basically the drug needs to be in your system to prevent that thing that's blocking the blocker that helps you with your erection. So that's how the drug actually, actually works. Uh, d did our friend um, to my left say that uh, Pfizer have already got a slow release version of Pfizer? No, Viagra. they have what they they have this oral dispersible tablet that I mentioned that they used, which was um, that they used to actually get an, an extension on their. But patent. there's no element of slow. Uh, there's no element of slow, slow release, release on the there. market, as far as I'm aware, with Viagra. And um, there's no point because Cialis have got the slow release market sewn up. Um, but the problem with Cialis, it doesn't start to work. So Cialis, work, they, call, they the, the nickname for it is the weekender because it lasts a long time but it doesn't work very quickly. You know, there is a little bit of recreational use to this, these tablets, you see, which you, yeah. you know. Uh, and in terms of uh, patient acceptability, what, what does the stuff taste like? The, it... the taste profile is good. So with NFL citrate, you'll know, uh, mentioned in the actual product. So with NFL citrate is in the core. So NFL citrate is incredibly bitter, really bad. You will not be able to put sildenafil citrate in your mouth. It's disgusting. It really is bad. So Denifil base doesn't have that same taste profile. So what we've done is we've taken the base, which citrate is based on. You, you make citrate by taking some Denifil base and adding citric acid to it to make it more soluble because in the gut you want it to be more soluble. Because our base doesn't have it. So we have a bit of a lemony flavor within there to make sure there's a nice flavor. It's deliberately designed with our product, so if you keep it in your mouth for two, three minutes, it will start to expose the core. You're like, oh my God, I need to get rid of it. So that's uh, part and the of base the, uh, is the very HRI soluble print. through the, the base, mouth. The base is very solid. Because the base, has a higher, uh, the base in the mouth has got a higher pH, you get better solubility and you get better absorption. So using that buccal lingual root is a really nice creative way. So in effect, we're putting 20% of in the core you get, remember that big, big impact from sublingual? So we're getting 20% and we're getting four times that amount, that amount being delivered quickly. The rest of it then goes in normal and slow. Uh, and the existing licensing for um, Viagra, uh, is, does that cover the base as well? Or is that going to have to be a separate regulatory application? No, the, the, the base is, is sildenafil. The citric acid is just a version of the base. So the 505, what we can I mean, the bioequivalence is, is fine no, no. using that. Uh, no, not in terms of bioequivalence, but in terms of regulatory approval. No, yeah. The, the base doesn't need separate no. regulatory. No. Okay. Because we're measuring that in the system. Hi. Uh, supposing you funded um, the phase three. Uh, yourself, mm -hmm. what kind of uh, royalty would you expect on sales? I, I think we'd be looking closer to about 10. So if we were to do a deal next year, we were looking five to six. If we get to the marketing authorization, you'll be talking 10 plus on the royalty. Okay, so considering it's only going to cost you 1.52 million quid, why would you ever partner for phase three? That's a very good question that we'll be talking to our shareholders about in the middle of 2018. When we get good quality data, then we'll be able to come back. You know, we couldn't do that now. But once we get the clinical data, then we can come back and say, this is why we w might want to do that ourselves. In the past, in my previous company, that's exactly what we have done. We've raised, it, it will take you a little bit more to get there. We don't have that funds to be able to commit to that now. But if we had the funds, you know, I would commit to that tomorrow. Um, just one for me. And it, you've mentioned two products. Is there, what, is there a the, does the portfolio contain any, any other products? Yes, yeah, so within the generics portfolio, we've got three others. We've got uh, an aprepotent, uh, which is an antiemetic drug for cancer treatment. We've got a version of paroxetine, which is um, a, a drug used in a different area, but we've got uh, the rights for it, or the, the, our pattern is for using it as a premature ejaculation. And we've got one for sartans, which are for antihypertension. So they're the four patents that we've filed the base using around this system. Thank you. If there's no more questions, then thank you very much indeed. Thank Nigel. you.